the City of Albuquerque Public Art Urban Enhancement Division and Department of Arts and Culture proudly present Take Another Look. Built on the foundation of two city ordinances, art in municipal places, and the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, the Public Art Urban Enhancement Division provides funds to artists to create art for the public, as well as arts organizations for arts and cultural programs. Join us as we discuss everything related to funding artists in the public realm with host Joni Palmer. Hello, I'm Joni Palmer and welcome back to Take Another Look at Albuquerque's Public Art. We've talked a lot so far in this podcast, starting with what is public art, the program budget, the new gallery in City Hall, glass art at the International District, and now murals. And this is the third, the last episode in a set of three, um, three episodes about murals. Today, I will be talking with Rose Eason, uh, Executive Director at Gallup Arts, and Madalena Salazar. She is the Executive Director of Working Classroom in Albuquerque. We'll be talking about the role of partnerships and community impact of murals in Albuquerque, as well as in Gallup. So first, let me tell you a little bit about my guests. So Rose Eason has served as the Executive Director of Gallup Arts since 26, June 2016. Under Rose's direction, Gallup Arts has significantly expanded its role within the community and deepened its positive community impact. Rose has developed Gallup Arts two gallery programs uh, to more fully support and engage artists and the community. She has engineered a multifaceted suite of youth-oriented art education programs. She has facilitated many productive community partnerships and has raised Gallup's profile as an arts and cultural center through her advocacy work. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And Madalena Salazar serves as the executive director of Youth Serving Arts and Social Justice Nonprofit Working Classroom. She is also the founder and principal of the Albuquerque-based creative consulting business, Third Space Vision, LLC. Previously, she was the Social Responsibility and Inclusion Program Manager for Westaf, which if you don't know Westaf, they've got a lot of great resources. Yes. They're a U.S. regional arts org that focuses on, um, on uh, Western imagination and arts and culture. And uh, she's the first Latino Cultural Programs Coordinator for the Denver Art Museum. She has been an educator and facilitator, administrator, consultant, and advocate centering on cultural and racial justice. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. Well, and these two gals know each other, so this is, uh, we should have a really great conversation. <laughs> yes. Um, so in the last three episodes about murals, um, I've talked about, I've talked with um, mural scholars, I've talked with muralists, artists, about the power and perception of murals, as well as the logistics of coordinating and making murals in Albuquerque. Today, we are going to dive into the role of partnerships in creating successful mural projects, and we'll talk about what does success mean, and we will talk about how communities are impacted by these mural projects. So let's get started. So for both of you, I, I have a question I've been asking all of my guests, and, and this will be summarized from all of the episodes, uh, how everybody has responded to these questions. Mm. So that should be really interesting to pull mm -hmm. all these together. So. What is a mural? How do you f define a mural? Well, <clears throat> coming from a background in art history, a mural is just quite literally uh, a painting, sometimes a mosaic or, or some other sort of two-dimensional visual art form on a wall. So mural comes from the Latin root muro, which is wall. So um, it's an artwork on a wall. Uh, most of the time, it is a painting. Um, but because it is on a wall, uh, it has a public presence and therefore it impacts the community that interacts with it, whether it's just a passerby, a tourist, um, the neighborhood that lives with it, um, you know, generations down the line that mm. may see it many years later. Um, so it it has a lot of public resonance. Mm. And how about you, Rose? I 100% agree with that. I think we have a conventional conception of a mural, a painting on the wall, um, usually something large scale, 
Mm. Usually something public, usually something that has something to do with public significance. <laughs> and I'll just say at Gallup Arts, we kind of play with that definition a lot. We've done small scale murals, we've done temporary murals. But really, to me, what we need to understand about murals and keep at the forefront of our minds when talking about thinking about creating murals is the impact that they mm -hmm. have. And, you know, I'm one of those people that thinks all public art is political and probably it should be political. <laughs> and that's the problem, but also that's the opportunity, right? So mm. uh, as Madalena was saying, murals shape the public. They shape the built environment, they augment mm. the built environment, and then they shape public perception and they help to shape our, our collective conscious. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's the most important thing. And I think that's the driving definition is their impact. Mm -hmm. Well, and with that in mind, what you just said is, why do you think that murals have grown uh, in popularity, not only in New Mexico, but across the United States? And you've alluded to some of that, <laughs> I believe. But either one of you, who yeah. else? I, I mean, I think there's actually a number of reasons why they've grown in popularity, um, in particular in, in certain settings. And I would say for New Mexicans, there's a cultural resonance there. Um, hmm. that I think may or may not be true in other communities, but I think is particularly true for New Mexicans because there is even a pre-colonization, pre-European context for murals. Mm -hmm. Kiva walls were painted in murals. Um, churches um, under the Spanish were painted in murals by indigenous artists. Um, you know, pre-Columbian Mexicans used murals and then that was revived again um, under modern Mexican muralists. So both from our um, Hispano-Chicano identities as well as our indigenous identities and background in history, murals have always been a part of the New Mexican visual environment. And so I think that for us, that like growth in the popularity just kind of ties back to what our cultures are already familiar with in terms mm. of visual um, in visual arts and visual culture. I think in other communities, there's a, a parallel cultural congruence. So you think of like communities that have really uh, popular um, like mural programs or um, are known for their murals. Mm -hmm. And I think of like Philadelphia, I think of Oakland, I think of um, Colombia in South America and Brazil. And some of those are because of um, in, in those urban environments, there was that DIY kind of art that many of us know as graffiti, which uh, eventually developed into either like self-made murals or later on murals that were commissioned um, is to be there in place um, for art from artists that had grown up as um, maybe unsanctioned artists in the streets. Mm -hmm. I can tell your art historian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Madeline is bringing all the context. And I'll say, too, that um, there is a long, obviously long and rich tradition of mural making in this part of the world. In addition to that, I think that it's, you know, people yearn to engage and connect and it's a the visual vocabulary is a shared one and murals are and i know that in previous episodes from listening to them people have talked about how accessible they are yeah. they don't require the same amount of resources um, as other forms of public art and so they're more easily getting back to what gallup arts does kind of played with and and they are a dialogue and a conversation that's not to undermine kind of their status as monumental art because mm -hmm. they, i think that again that's super important to be aware of um, but they they are more more flexible and more fluid and uh you know it's a, it's a way that people can give voice to whatever they feel the need to give voice to in their communities so, and, and actually, once again, you have led me to my last question for both of you in, in this, in, you know, in, initial uh, segment is share with us how you think that murals impact the communities you work with. And this is from community members of all ages, as well as the artists. And how does this work impact your organization? You want to go first? Sure. I feel like I keep putting in. <laughs> no, no, I'm happy to, I'm happy to follow you always, Madalena. <laughs> um, 
I think, you know, murals are, so I'll just say for Gallup, there's one mural that we have not been able to accomplish in my kind of decade in Gallup. And um, it's a mural that I know a segment of the community wants to see uh, put up and one that artists have proposed to put up. And it has to do with an indigenous activist who um, is you know, controversial, according to some perspectives, named Larry Casus, who was killed in the early 70s. And that just that brings the whole conversation home about who murals, who murals are for, who gets to decide <laughs> to put them in. It goes back to their political nature. And it also speaks to the potential of murals and how they can impact a community and make people feel seen and understood and represented and heard and, and kind of broaden the horizons and, and, and create a more inclusive dialogue within a community. Uh, and so when we don't do them, sometimes it's as telling as when we do do them, at right. least in Gallup's case. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, I feel like that's such a, a rich question. But um, I think I'll uh, answer that by kind of reflecting back on more tangible experiences. So, for example, uh, Prior to this meeting, I had a meeting with a couple of muralists that Working Classroom is currently working with and has worked with for years, in one case, 30 plus years. Mm. Um, and that is uh, our local treasure, Joe Stevenson, who really um, kind of led the mural movement here in Albuquerque. Um, and many of, especially some of the uh, long standing murals can be attributed to him and in some cases working classroom as well and um, another artist we work with um, Jade Cruz who um, has a mural over by Harwood has a mural on the South Broadway Cultural Center just recently completed one with us last year at Siembra High School downtown um, so it's kind of like two different generations of muralists and we're planning work together and um, you know, you see that sort of intergenerational aspect, particularly because our organization also works with young people. And those young people typically come from the neighborhoods um, associated with the mural. Mm. So I'm thinking about resilience that Nani Chacon did with working classroom over mm. at Washington Middle School. And so it's like telling these hyper local histories. Mm. Um, so in a lot of cases, they may be very they may be controversial, but maybe so subtly that you don't really recognize it at the time because mm. they're such hyper local histories because they're coming out of the stories of lived experiences, of neighborhoods, of families um, that is being brought to light, as, as Rose has mentioned a number of times, in really monumental scale. And so I think a lot about my work with Joe Stevenson now and the fact that seeing his murals go up around me as I was growing up in Albuquerque, like really shaped my lived experience and my future career and my perception of Albuquerque as a cultural center. I always just really felt like we were a, a really creative people because mm. of these murals that I saw around us. Mm. Um, he was describing that this one mural that we'll be working to restore with him in um, the Kirtland neighborhood um, just off of Broadway and Gibson or I should say University in Gibson, um, that mural was painted because it was a site of graffiti battles and gang battles between mm. the Crips and the Bloods in the 90s. And that mural helped to restore the neighborhood, literally. Like, it, it helped to um, alleviate the graffiti that was happening, but that also helped the neighborhood come together and tell their story of who they were as a neighborhood, you know, kind of one of the major black neighborhoods historically of Albuquerque. Um, it brought a lot of, I think, racial healing through the process, obviously not fully solved, but it really did help tell a story of members of Albuquerque that would maybe not have been uh, brought to light otherwise. otherwise. A lot of black leaders from the moment Albuquerque was established to the present time and and building a relationship between folks same with Hades murals highlighting the culture particularly of the south valley neighborhoods of albuquerque mm. um you know our our cultural healing practices our um agricultural practices our activist practices so i think a lot about those histories that we 
don't get told in our storybooks mm -hmm. and wouldn't know about ourselves um, and how that gives us a lot of empowerment. It builds community within communities that could potentially be a little bit more separated from each other. Um, so I think it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And how about you? What would you like to add? Oh man, <laughs> I, I think that's spot on what Madeline is talking about in terms of the impact and how murals can bring people together and, and transform lived environments in the sense of both lived and environment. And I really mm -hmm. appreciate what she said about telling stories that are often left untold or mm -hmm. ignored. All right, well, I'm gonna move us into, first we're gonna start in Albuquerque with Working Classroom. Um, so Working Classroom's mission, as according to your website, <laughs> is to cultivate the artistic, civic, and academic minds of youth through an in-depth arts project with contemporary artists to amplify historically ignored voices, resist systemic injustices, and imagine a more equitable society. Yeah. Like what you've been talking <laughs> exactly. about. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so as you said, you've been working with muralists for over 30 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, what role do murals play in your organization? Where are they in your priorities or? Yeah, I mean, no. that's an interesting question. I feel like um, it's the most visible expression of what we have done over the several decades that we have been an organization here in Albuquerque. Um, and I would say that um, it's the uh, art form perhaps that is one that uh, young people are most drawn to because mm -hmm. because they're seeing it happen in their communities and there's a lot of folks that you know I grew up with or that live in the neighborhoods that we serve or whatever that even if they've never participated with working classroom they may have seen one mm -hmm. of our murals go up and I remember that was when I was in um college and living downtown, I remember seeing working classroom, working mm. out in spaces with artists and young people and, you know, thinking about that practice of including young people along with the artists, which is what we've always done. Um, so it's really, like I said, it's the most visible out there kind of thing that we do. Um, I don't know that I, I prioritize things per se, but what I do love about our murals is that it is this um, culmination of all of these different strands of working with neighborhoods and listening to their needs, their priorities, their stories, their um, identities, right? Um, working in this like managerial logistical kind of way of like, you know, uh, earning funding and, uh, you know, working out timelines and uh, drafting designs to make sure that they're approved by the stakeholders, whether it's the funders right. or the neighborhood or, you know, whatever it may be listening to the um, young people share their opinions about design and, um, like identity and history and whatever they want to put into the mural. Um, and, and we always try to work with artists that are very uh, able to be mentors, leaders, mm. as well as kind of directors in that sense that like want to collaborate with young people in this mm. process. They want to educate. So it's not just, you know, some artist that's and this yeah. happens too, I should say, right. in, in mural making is that there are artists and organizations that just like plunk down into a neighborhood and then they just like put something up. And sometimes as those in other cities have become like mural festivals and that's fine if that's the intention. But for us, we very deliberately work with artists that are gonna be collaborators, with young people, with us, with funders, with neighborhood, um, that they're gonna be listening they're going to be willing to uh, share process, be transparent, listen. I think I already said that. Um, <laughs> so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah listening listen. is super, super important. <laughs> and also um, feel the courage to uplift ideas that may be controversial, perhaps, but, um, but can perhaps be visually expressed in a way that um, will be uh, suitable for everybody involved. 
Well, you, you've already led into some of my upcoming questions. <laughs> um, so those partnerships, so you're talking about partnerships with the artists, partnerships with youth, right? Where, where do the youth come from? is one of my questions, mm -hmm. but what are the other partnerships? Yeah, sure. Um, so we focus on Albuquerque's um, and Bernalillo County's most underserved neighborhoods. Um, so we focus on the neighborhoods that surround us, Barelas, downtown, uh, the South Valley, uh, the southern part of the west side, um, the International District. Um, but we also are open to everybody and we've always been very intentionally uh, multiracial organization that is committed to anti-oppression work. Um, and that means that we are primarily a Latino, Latinx, Chicanx organization. Um, and then our next significant population is um, coming from native communities. Mm. But nevertheless, we want to bring our cultural and racial perspectives to the work that we do and, and how that informs the artwork that we create and the uh, stories that we uplift. Um, so those are the primary neighborhoods. It's usually lower economic neighborhoods um, mm -hmm. in Albuquerque. Again, open to everybody still. Um, and those are the youth that we tend to recruit. Um, we are able to recruit them through partnerships with schools. Mm -hmm. So we work with middle high school age ranged. You don't have to be enrolled in school to participate with us. I say 12 to 21. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sometimes they're being recruited by their siblings, their friends, <laughs> you know, sometimes teachers are picking them out and, you know, getting them to us or other mentors in their lives. Um, other partnerships we have with, you know, in addition to schools is, um, you know, community school um, coordinators have been great mm. helps for the community schools. Uh, we also have partnerships with other nonprofits that share our values. Um, and sometimes they are coming to us or sometimes even businesses. So like we did uh, the mural on Kay and Molly textiles. Uh, we did a recent mural over at um, Quirky Books off of Central. Mm. So, you know, sometimes it's businesses, sometimes it's nonprofit partners. Sometimes we're reaching out to them. Sometimes they're reaching out to us. Um, sometimes we already have a budget from our funders. So our partners are like McCune Foundation, Albuquerque Community Foundation, Public Art at the city. Mm -hmm. um, the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund is a supporter of ours. Um, going back to the intro. Um, and so sometimes, you know, those are aspects of it. Neighborhood associations, once we find mm. a place in the um, neighborhood, can be a big help. And sometimes it's just folks wandering by and wanting to <laughs> know more and wanting to volunteer. But that's a lot of different partnerships, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. All different flavors. <laughs> yes. Right? Um, so, and, and you've, you've talked about some of the different ones that have been you've highlighted some. Is there one relationship, partnership, project that you find particularly meaningful? That is a tough one. Um, there are, they are all very meaningful in their own ways. And mm -hmm. I know that's a very diplomatic yeah. <laughs> way of saying that. Um, but everybody does bring something different to the table, whether it's different funders or whether it is different artists or different schools uh, or communities. And I think that's actually a, a crucial part of what we bring to the table is knowing that everybody is going to be kind of every project is going to be different and every um, community is different. And, you know, there will be some similarities, but you have to have that flex flexibility a little bit. Um, but we also have enough experience in our organization to know that we're very rooted in our values. And if we're seeing that from the initial or throughout the project, if those values are not aligned and our mm. values are on our website um, as well, um, if those values are not aligned, then it's not going to work out right. in the end. Right. Like mm -hmm. whether it's. Um, you know, we also believe in like anti-racist principles. So if it's the sense of like urgency and rush and this has to happen now and it has to happen this way and we can't make any mistakes or whatever, um, you know, that's not going to work for us because we believe in flexibility. We believe in being open and honest and correcting and evolving, evolving, having yeah. conversations. Um, 
so it has to be values aligned. Um, like I said, we don't work with artists who don't want to communicate about the process, who don't want to educate, you know, who don't want to be mentors. Um, so there are particular, and, and there's some artists who are like, I'm not a teacher and that's mm -hmm. okay. That's right. fine. Go be an artist. Right. We want to support there's you. There's lots of room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to take us over to Gallup. Right. And um, so the Gallup Arts mission, according to your website, is to foster creativity, culture, commerce, and quality of life in Gallup and McKinley counties uh, through the arts. They are committed to growing Gallup's creative economy and art scene for the benefit of the entire community. Mm -hmm. And it also states our robust suite of programs includes two art galleries, artist talks, arts and musical fes festivals, youth art programs, art classes, and public art projects. Yep. So, Rose, you don't have a public art program per se, um, but you've done a lot of murals as part of the arts and cultural work that you're doing. So how do mur what role do murals play? Because there's a lot of things that you're doing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Gallup Arts is the primary arts provider for our community, and we do serve one in five residents through over a dozen different programs every year. So we are doing wow. a lot. Um, and one of the roles that we've taken on is to kind of uh, manage our, our community's public art program because we don't have a formal one. We don't have a Department of Arts and Culture in our city or our county. We don't even have like a public art committee. Um, and so Gallup Arts really has stepped in to steward the mm -hmm. community's public art. And our major goal as part of that is, as I was saying before, to um, kind of foreground historically marginalized perspectives and expand the horizons of public art in town. Um, so, for example, we did a project, or we helped our Main Street, our Gallup's, Gallup Main Street Arts and Cultural District program launch an Art in the Alleys initiative, mm. and we advocated for the first muralist to participate in that project to be a young Diné artist from the area. Her name's Marina Esquites, and she did a mural that has two little girls blowing bright pink bubblegum, blowing these big, beautiful, bright pink <laughs> bubblegum bubbles while herding sheep. And that mural is so significant because a lot of, or you know, 99% of Gallup's murals are really historically minded, really academic minded. Um, but this one really is personal and intimate and resonates on a deeper level with our community. You know, our mm. other murals are more outward facing, trying to project a certain image of Gallup. But this one really speaks to the people of Gallup and does that community building work. And then kind of the second part of stewarding our public art is that Gallup Arts has been uh, working to deal with, for lack of a better term, the historic murals in our community. One of mm -hmm. our major projects centers on the New Deal art in town, and we have a, a couple murals as part of that, of course, and we've been engaged in getting um, more perspectives to the table to kind of deal with the, you know, one of them is a, a history of the Southwest from a dominant white male perspective. So how do we, how do, we deal with that? It still exists within our community. Right. What do we do with it? That's something we've been focused on as well. So. Um and, and you've alluded to this in terms of the variety of partners that you have. So can you tell us about that that range? I mean, earlier we were talking, you have like 31 flavors, <laughs> you know, right? Um, and it sounds like you do as yeah. well. We do, I'd say we have a core partnership. Most of Gallup's uh, public art is in our downtown. We're definitely, obviously not as big as Albuquerque. Um, that goes without saying. But we have a downtown partnership. Our business improvement district, our Main Street program, of course our city, property owners, business owners. And uh, that, that partnership has grown over the years and, and is focused on downtown revitalization, broadly speaking. But it's definitely greased the wheels for some of our public art projects. And then, you know, we've also cultivated um, a really diverse and rich network of local artists who bring us ideas or, you know, we can tap when opportunities arise. So tell me about one particular project. And, and you were talking about the art in the alleys. Mm -hmm. Is there another project that you'd like to tell the audience about that is significant to you or to the community? Hmm. Well, one I always talk about is our downtown trash can painting project, which doesn't sound very glamorous, but it was one of the first public art projects I did when I uh, moved back to Gallup. And what I love about it is that it started because a business owner just didn't like the look of our concrete trash cans mm. and just uh, took two home and, and had an artist come paint them and then return them to their locations and everybody bought into this idea that we should paint all 70 of them. And I love it because it just speaks to small towns, you know, 
the at their best they mm -hmm. don't have the same bureaucracy and you can just steal public property <laughs> and return <laughs> it and no one no, they heavy. don't not care they celebrate yeah. that yeah. right heavy projects right and yeah. then we had like 30 artists involved and mm. and the trash cans they just they brought the whole downtown alive and they I love it because some of them are about Gallup's history and the cultures but then others are just about people's personal experiences and memories and you know what that somebody painted what the different rock shapes on the uh, off of I-40 look like to them and you know you get just this tapestry um, and of rich vibrant culture historically contemporaneously it all comes together so yeah. I yeah that's that project has a special place <laughs> that sounds great um, well, we have a few minutes left, so I, I want to ask you both is what are the what is key to a successful, productive, healthy fill in the blank partnership? And I guess I'm, I'm going to say communication yeah. while we're all being silent. Yeah, I'm exactly. communication. <laughs> communication is a good one. Yeah, okay. I, I think going back to my last statement, I think uh, being values aligned mm -hmm. is really important, whether it's how you work, um, what kind of outcome you expect and being uh, communicative, listening to others. You know, I think sharing values is a really mm. key aspect. And I think, too, one of the roles that a, an organization like Galbarts or Working Classroom can play is to kind of mediate between, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, some of the more bureaucratic elements yeah. and especially if it's on city property or needs government approval or funding or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And the artist and then also the community and kind of triangulate yeah. that mm. uh, to make sure that the artist's vision and intention is upheld, that the community is engaged and involved in meaningful ways and yet you know, all the T's are crossed and I's dotted and yeah. no one gets mad at the end. <laughs> yeah, that's a huge, a huge aspect. That's a really good point, yeah. And, and so that would be, so what advice would you give to a muralist, an artist who is coming into partnership with mm. you all. I think that actually what Rose was speaking to is being a mediator is actually a really good piece of that is maybe work with an organization like Gallup Arts or Working Classroom or somebody that works similarly because I think we have been that sort of bolster not to like try to pat ourselves on the back too much, but we for emerging artists or artists who are new to muralism or new to working with young people or intergenerationally or whatever, um, or working with city or funders, other funders, that bureaucratic side of things, that's that like scaffolding to mm -hmm. use a mural term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we could be that scaffolding and then they start to recognize that process of how this is built out and how to work with all of these stakeholders themselves. And then they could do that on their own right? throughout their career. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure most artists who opt for the life of a muralist understand, you know, how to be open and receptive and responsive yeah. to community needs and ideas and that it is kind of co-created at some level mm -hmm. um, and it might not be the case of just them being able to fully execute exactly right. <laughs> what they would like so it takes that kind of mm -hmm. level of understanding as well well i have to wrap up i could i could talk for quite a bit longer oh, so with both you. of you <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you very much yeah. for joining us today this has been great uh, I want to alert our audience, whether you're YouTube or the podcast, that the newsletter will be um, highlighting some of the projects and people, the artists that you all have been talking about today. So thanks Excellent. again. Nice. Yep. Thank you Thank for having you. us. Yeah. Well, okay. So I'm going to wrap up now. So dear listeners and watchers, I hope this set of episodes has helped you learn about the history, the power and perceptions of murals and the logistics of creating murals and tune you into murals in Albuquerque and in Gallup. So you can head on over to Gallup yes, and check please. out <laughs> the uh, murals in the alleys. Mm -hmm. That sounds cool. Uh, check out Working Classroom and Gallup Arts. You will find Working Classroom at all lowercase workingclassroom.org. You can also follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Working Classroom, all lowercase, and also sign up for their newsletter on their website. Uh, you'll find Gallup Arts at all lowercase gallupartsorg You can follow them on Facebook at Gallup Arts and also on Instagram at underscore Gallup Arts. If you want to learn more about arts projects, events, and happenings in Gallup and in McKinley counties, uh, you can sign up for their monthly newsletter mm -hmm. on their website.
Also, check out our newsletter, as I, was, I just plugged a minute ago, to learn more about the topics we cover and the guests who join us for these uh, podcasts. You can sign up for our newsletter <laughs> on the public art webpage, cabq.gov backslash public art backslash podcast. So I hope you will join us for our next set of episodes. Uh, they will be about public arts and technology. The first of this three-part series will be released on Wednesday, May 8th. And thank you for listening. Uh, we hope that after you've listened to this podcast that you will take another look at Albuquerque's public art. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Great talking with both of you. Thanks for listening. To learn more about the Albuquerque Public Art Program, the Public Art Collection, opportunities for artists, and so much more, visit cabq.gov slash public art. To learn more about the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, visit cabq.gov slash UETF. Tune in next time to take another look at the City of Albuquerque Public Art Urban Enhancement Division.